I'm going to play a dirty trick on you. Um, I think you probably came expecting simply to be lectured to. But you see, I am playing hooky from my class at the University of Texas at Austin. And I've, if I run Austin, I would be giving a quiz. So I'm going to pose a quiz to you. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what one of the questions on the final exam for my students this semester is going to be. I'm teaching a large introductory course in American history that covers the period from 1865 to the present. And one of the large stories in this period of American history, not surprisingly, is World War II. So here's the question that's going to be posed to the students, and I'm going to pose it to you. It begins with a statement. World War II is often described in American history as, the, and I'll use quotes, the good war. And I'm going to ask the students, and I'll ask you to consider, so what's so good about a war that was the worst war in human history in which 60 million people or more died, in which devastation was spread over half the globe, and which upended all manner of previous institutions, expectations, and arrangements. It was the worst war in American history except for the Civil War. And yet, it is called the Good War. So I want you to think about that because I'm going to be sort of elaborating on this. And I hope that should you run into any of my students, you won't tell them that I gave you the answer as to why it's called the Good War. And, and actually, it's not just sort of why it's called the Good War, but whether it, to what extent it was a Good War. Are we kind of kidding ourselves? Or for that matter, you will probably know, um, I guess because some of you probably fit into this description, the generation that fought World War II for the United States is often called the greatest generation. And I've thought as a child of that generation, well, what does that make us? Chopped liver? But it is, these are descriptions that stick for reasons. So I'm going to investigate this. And I'm going to come at it kind of sideways by pointing out that there are Two really great presidents in American history. These are the two presidents who are considered by a consensus of historians and political scientists to be the greatest in American history. And so as part of your morning quiz, I'll ask you, who are those two great presidents? Well, for those of you who say George Washington, no, he's a little bit below this. He gets credit because he was the first. And if you're the first, you set a lot of examples and precedents. But in terms of decision making, in terms of taking the country in a new direction, the two great presidents are FDR and Abraham Lincoln. Okay? So, Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt. Now, what was it that made them so great? What was it that made them stand out among the other 40, well, the other 43, 42 men who have been president. War. Exactly. They were presidents, and not just any old war, but the worst wars in American history. So it is a paradox of American history that the greatest presidents presided over the worst moments, the worst wars. And it's not a coincidence. It is the wars that allow the presidents to rise above other presidents that give them the opportunity to rise to the challenge and achieve greatness and to take the country in a new direction. Now, I'm going to make the argument to you this morning that World War II was the, it was the most important thing to happen in American history in the 20th century. I could go beyond that and talk about the most important thing to happen in world history in the 20th century. But since my assignment is the U.S. and World War II, I'll settle for it being the biggest thing in American history, American history in the 20th century, just as the Civil War was the biggest thing in American history in the 19th century. So what is it that makes World War II such a big deal? World War II was the beginning of what I can call 
the really modern era in American history. The modern era that lasted from, and I'll just sort of pull some dates kind of out of the air. Let's see, how about uh, Jan uh, December 7th, 1941, to January 20th, 2017. And this is, we'll call it the modern era of American history. It's the era of World War II. It's the era when the United States achieved something that other countries have achieved over in times past. And that, well, a question for us, for anybody who's interested in history, for anybody who's an American citizen is, well, did that era that I said ended in 2017, did it really end? Is there more to this story? So the story begins, well, no, it doesn't begin. To develop the story, I'm going to present to you something that I, well, immodestly call Brands' second law of history. <laughs> and, I, and the reason I call it, I have a series of them. There are actually ten. Uh, I won't call them commandments, but they're, uh, they're really observations about history. And the first of Brands' laws of history is that there are no laws of history. But there are tendencies, there are patterns, there are trends. So history doesn't tell us exactly what's going to happen, but it gives us a ballpark area to look in. It allows us not to be surprised. So, Brands' second, oh, oh the, the reason I call them Brands' laws of history is that I, I tell this to my students, and I don't want them to think that these are anybody else's laws of history. These are observations, and I don't want them to walk out of my class and say, well, the laws of history are so-and-so. Well, no, they're not. These are my laws of history, and you take them, and you can certainly take them for what they're worth. But Brands' second law of history says that sooner or later, Countries get the foreign policies they can afford. And this is a way of linking the economic power, the economic prowess of a country with the footprint that it establishes or attempts to establish in the world at large. So our story about the importance of World War II really goes back to the 19th century. And the 19th century was a time when Americans had very little expectation regarding what the role of their country should be in the world. Americans looked at their own country, and they said, this is a small country, and it's not particularly powerful in world affairs. Its economy is not particularly dynamic or productive. And we Americans have lots to do just minding things at home. And the United States had the luxury of being able to do so during the 19th century, because as a French diplomat remarked, the United States is peculiarly blessed among the nations in being surrounded on the north by one weak country, Canada, on the south by another weak country, Mexico, on the east by fish, on the west by fish. Whereas countries of Europe had to deal with one another at close quarters, the United States did not. And Americans could luxuriate in the idea that, in fact, the U.S. can get along without the world pretty well. Or more precisely, the U.S. can get along with the world on America's terms rather than other countries' terms. The United States spent most, spent most of the 19th century developing its own economy, expanding its own territory. And I, when I say the United States didn't have a really active foreign policy in the 19th century, I have to make an exception, and then you might consider this a very important exception, for the fact that it was expanding across North America. It was dealing with the Native Americans, and to some extent with the, the European colonial powers when they had holdings in North America, but it didn't have to deal with the other major powers at close quarters. Britain in the War of 1812, but after that, it was essentially nothing down to 1898. So during this period, and the reason I'm emphasizing this period to begin with is that the leaders of World War II, the leaders of World War II were born in this time. And they grew up in a time when Americans had few expectations that their country would have much to do with the rest of the world. Franklin Roosevelt was born in 1882. And he came of age at a time when the United States still had very modest expectations of itself. And the reason, again, the reason for these modest expectations was that the United States was a relatively poor country. And poor countries do not have ambitious foreign policies. Poor countries adjust to the world as it exists. Rich countries 
try to change the world to suit their preferences. And the change during the United States as a poor country to the United States as a rich country would occur in the 50 years be leading up to World War II. By 1900, by 1900 when Franklin Roosevelt was 18 years old, the United States had developed into the largest economy in the world. And so potentially by 1900, the United States could have had this very ambitious foreign policy, except that, and this is why at the beginning of that Brands of Second Law, it's the sooner or later countries get the foreign policies they can afford. And usually there's a, a lag, and the lag is about a generation or so. Because people like Franklin Roosevelt grew up at a time when Americans expected that their country would have just a modest role in world affairs. And so, in the first part of the 20th century, so when Theodore Roosevelt, excuse me, Franklin Roosevelt, is in his 20s and 30s, the United States has to be dragged very reluctantly into the First World War. And the United States, the President of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, wanted to sit this one out. And at the beginning of the war, when the war broke out in 1914, Wilson urged his compatriots, urged the Americans, to be neutral in thought as well as in deed. This is their problem, not our problem. He turned out to change his mind over the course of the next two and a half years, and he led the United States into World War I in the spring of 1917, and Americans fought for a year and a half until the autumn of 1918. American participation was decisive, either directly or indirectly, in allowing the Allies to defeat the Central Powers, and the United States was on the winning side. And Americans came away from the war, well, it was very interesting, because Americans came away from the war initially thinking, great, we won, we did this great thing. And in fact, by the time the United States went into the war, Woodrow Wilson, the President of the United States, had said, this isn't one we're going to sit out, this is one that we must fight. We are going to fight to make the world safe for democracy. And Wilson transformed this conflict in Europe into a challenge for, a challenge of the American way of dealing with the world, a challenge of the American way of politics. The United States must go to war to make the world safe for democracy. The United States was on the winning side. I'm not going to say the United States won the war, but the United States and its allies won the war. And initially there was celebration in the United States, but attitudes changed quite quickly. There was a peace conference at the end of the war, and at the peace conference, President Wilson did not exactly get what he had hoped for, did not exactly get what he had promised. He got the creation of a League of Nations. It was the idea that the countries of the world most must no longer live as outlaws one to the other. And from this perspective, countries go to war. They resolve their disputes by force, by arms, because there is no acknowledged power above countries. You and I, if we have a dispute, if I want to sue you over something or if you do something that I object to, Long ago in civilized societies, we have suspended our right, we've abdicated our right to have this out personally. And I don't come over and smash you in the face and have it out that way. No, no, we appeal to this larger authority. We go to court. But there was, and to a large degree there still is, no international court that the major countries of the world have abdicated, have surrendered that authority to. And so each country is tempted to try to have its way by force. This is the ultimate way of resolving these disputes. And Wilson believed that that must end. And so he got the creation of a League of Nations. It didn't have everything that he wanted, but it was better than nothing. He brought it back to the United States, and by this time, by the time he brought it back to the United States, it's almost, well, nine months after the war was over. The Paris Peace Conference took a long time. Americans had begun to sort of look away from the war. They began to think that maybe the war wasn't everything it had been cracked up to be. And, well, partly because of that quirk in the U.S. Constitution that says that treaties have to be ratified by two-thirds of the Senate. If it had been a straight up and down vote, if it had been a vote like the vote for Brexit, where a simple majority says we're going to make this big decision, 
if that had been the case, if that position had been in force in the United States in 1919, the United States would have joined the League of Nations. There was a simple majority in favor of the League of Nations, but not that super majority that was required. But the United States did not join the League of Nations, and Americans reverted to that 19th century way of thinking, that what happens in Europe, in particular, is not our problem. And for the next two decades, Americans went not simply back to the 19th century, but even almost before that, they became almost aggressively isolationist. They don't Tell us what's going on in those other countries. And as bad as it might get there, that's not reason to reconsider. That's confirmation of the fact that we were right not to have anything to do with those other countries because they're always getting into trouble. And as Europe and as East Asia began to dissolve into war, to move toward war in the 1930s, Americans, very many, if not all of them, but a working majority, patted themselves on the back for, first of all, having fled Europe those who came to, the Ameri to America from Europe, having fled Europe and getting out of that place that always seems to be going to war, and also have had the good sense not to join the League of Nations. And Americans were quite happy to say, this is not our problem. One of those who argued that, well, you're wrong. It is our problem, or it will be, was Franklin Roosevelt. That kid who was born in 1882, who came of age at the beginning of the 20th century, who was paying attention to the fact that the United States had this growing economy, that the United States had these interests that were spreading around the world, who was in Woodrow Wilson's cabinet as Assistant Secretary of the Navy in, during the period of the First World War, and who came away from that war believing that the United States needed to play a continuing role in world affairs, that the United States, American democracy, would not be safe unless the United States paid attention, that World War I was just the start of bad stuff, and more bad stuff would occur if the United States turned its back. But Franklin Roosevelt was a politician with ambitions, and he could see the way the wind was blowing. It was blowing in a distinctly isolationist direction in the 1920s and 1930s. And so he silenced his internationalist views, kept them to himself, and went about his business. He got distracted, diverted by contracting polio in the 1920s. And then along came the Great Depression. And the Great Depression focused Americans' minds even more on American affairs and not on the affairs of the world. To Americans, it looked as though the Great Depression was something that they needed to deal with on their own. Franklin Roosevelt became president in 1933. By this time, it was clear to everybody that the United States had the most powerful economy in the world. And if the world was going to get out of this almost global depression, the United States was going to have to play a key role in cooperation among nations. And Franklin Roosevelt said, no, we're not going to do that. What Franklin Roosevelt said to borrow from a slogan that would come into use some years later, he said, America first. This is something that we need to do. We need to focus on what's going on in this country. America's trading partners, America's potential allies, allies from World War I, wrung their hands and said, this is a terrible thing. That Roosevelt, the president, is making it impossible for the world to dig its way out of this depression. But Roosevelt believed that it was necessary. He believed it was politically necessary, and Roosevelt was a political animal. He believed it was politically necessary to address America's problems at home first. And so was launched the New Deal. And the New Deal was this attempt to revive the American economy, to put a safety net under those people who were suffering most acutely during the Depression, to try to prevent the recurrence of something like the Depression. But Roosevelt initially tried to do this on an almost exclusive American basis. The first couple of years of the New Deal were relatively successful, not exactly in reviving the economy, although 
the economy did improve from 1933. Roosevelt rescued the banking system, and in a series of measures passed in the first three months of his first term, which came to be called the 100 Days, he sent 15 major bills to Congress, and Congress passed them all, basically just rubber stamps. Some of them were passed without even having been read. And it looked as though things were improving. Well, what was improving more than anything was the attitude of Americans, the attitude, the, the belief that somebody in Washington cares about me. Now, keep this in mind, because this is an important element in what's going to happen in World War II and why World War II was called the Good War. I should point out here that Benjamin Franklin once said, this is at the end of the Revolutionary War when he was America's chief diplomat in Paris, Benjamin Franklin said that there never was a good war or a bad peace. Franklin was one who recognized that almost as bad as peace can get is better than the best of wars. Nonetheless, we have this idea of a good war. So, Franklin Roosevelt is president. The New Deal is coming along. Things seem to be improving. Americans' attitude is improving, in fact, faster than the economy is improving. And Americans who thought that under the Republicans during the 1920s and 1930s, who were left to their own devices, believed that somebody was looking out for them. And here I will digress very briefly to lay out for you what I consider to be the two uh, fairly opposing principles of human organization. Every society has to figure out how individuals relate to the larger group. And there are two competing principles. They compete in different countries. They compete within the United States and other countries at different times. One principle is the principle of individualism. And it can be summarized by it's every man for himself. And this is the principle that Americans have very often sort of prided themselves on having. Because in the United States, there is the great honor and respect paid to the individual, the person who made himself, or these days, herself, the self-made man, and the idea that we are rugged individualists. So on the one hand, we have the principle of it's every man for himself. And there are times and places where this is appropriate and perhaps most productive. And the other principle is, you could call it the communitarian principle, that says we're all in this together. And this attitude of we're all in this together usually gains purchase in times when there is some sort of collective challenge, a challenge to the nation as a whole. Under the individualistic ethos, if something bad happens to you, well, tough luck for you. But if something bad happens to everybody, then we're all in this together. And this was the thinking that began, this was the thinking underlying the New Deal and what came to be called the American welfare state. Social Security. Social Security was a response to the arbitrary, the capricious nature of the Great Depression. And the fact that people who had worked all their lives, done everything they were supposed to do, worked and saved and prepared for their retirement, they could lose everything when their bank collapsed, they could lose everything when they lost their job, they could lose their homes, they could lose anything that they had by way of health care. They could just be utterly lost as a result, and this is the key, of something that was beyond their control. And this just happened to them. And so they could use that helping hand. There was this idea in this depression that in some ways we're all in this together. Now, when I say we're all in this together, the Great Depression, excuse me, the, the New Deal, the New Deal was popular, quite popular. Franklin Roosevelt was re-elected in 1936 in one of the largest landslides in American political history. But what does that mean? It meant that 61% of voters voted for him. And in American politics, that qualifies as a landslide. But it also means that 39% voted against him. So, even when I say that in the 1930s there was this embrace of this communitarian ideal, it wasn't a universal embrace, and, and keep this in mind, because it's never going to go away. This challenge is going to arise. But anyway, Roosevelt is reelected, and he launches the second New Deal at the beginning of his second term. And in his, well, you could say in his ambition, maybe you could say in his hubris, 
He decides that because the Supreme Court has ruled against him on critical New Deal legislation, he's going to change the composition of the Supreme Court. The so-called court packing scheme was launched. And even many of Roosevelt's strongest supporters said, this time you've gone too far. And that was the beginning of the end of the New Deal. And Franklin Roosevelt understood that maybe he had pushed things too far. Franklin Roosevelt understood Somebody, and a number of people identified George Washington as one of the greatest of presidents. And I said, well, it was partly because he was the first. You want to know the most important thing that George Washington did as president? He quit after two terms. <laughs> because there is nothing in the Constitution, excuse me, there was nothing in the Constitution that said you couldn't have a president for life. That, in effect, the presidency could become sort of like the papacy. You get elected, and then you serve until you die. And if George Washington had done that, you can bet that the nature of the presidency would have been entirely different. But when George Washington said, I've had enough, then two terms became the de facto outer limit. And Franklin Roosevelt was looking to the end of his second term in 1940, as 1940 ap approached. And he had to look at the end of his second term with serious disappointment because the depression had not ended. It had improved, but then there was a sharp recession in 1937 in which nearly all the gains of the, the new, all the gains of the previous few years had, were lost. And things were as bad, unemployment was as bad by the end of 1937 as it had been in 1933. And furthermore, opposition to the New Deal was emerging. Now, there's a critical aspect of timing here, and some of this is simply sort of the, the serendipity, the accidental nature of, in history, sometimes things just, just sort of happen. And so one of the things that was happening is the Social Security Act was signed, implemented in 1935. And I'm going to guess that many of you are participants in Social Security, sort of whether you like it or not. And usually when you're on the receiving end of it, you like it more sometimes than when you were simply on the contributing end. Well, in 1935 and 1936 and 1937 and 1938, almost everybody was on the contributing end and almost nobody was on the receiving end. The first Social Security pension check was mailed out in 1940. So... During that four and a half year period between the passage of the act and 1940, it was quite vulnerable because all sorts of people were having money taken out of their paychecks and they had nothing to show for it. Republicans had not reconciled themselves to Social Security and if, and if an unfriendly president and administration had succeeded Franklin Roosevelt after the 1940 elections, Social Security could have been wiped off of the books. And it looked as though that was going to happen because, well, there's this two-term rule and Franklin Roosevelt had by this time cast some doubt among his supporters, but he had alienated Southern Democrats, most of whom had looked on the New Deal with grave suspicion from the start, but they decided that this court packing scheme was a step too far. And then in the 1938 election season, Roosevelt actually campaigned against some of these conservative Democrats. And this was violating all the rules. So they basically defected from the New Deal. And it was really clear that Roosevelt's time in office was winding down. And at best, Franklin Roosevelt would be considered a mediocre president, a two-term president who did not accomplish the one thing that, above all, Americans wanted him to do pull the country out of the Depression. And then what happened? World War II. World War II happened. Now, there's a lot, there's a lot goes into World War II happening. Um, but it was clear that the war was coming. The war really started in Asia first, when Japan invaded China and occupied Manchuria, the northeastern province of China, starting in 1931, and then launched an all-out war on the rest of China proper in 1937. And Americans looked at this upsetting of the status quo in East Asia with concern, 
but also with our remembrance that the Pacific Ocean is 8,000 miles wide. And really, what did anybody in the United States care about what was going on in China? We will just ignore that. We've got stuff at home to worry about. Franklin Roosevelt tried to nudge Americans in the direction of paying attention to what was going on in China. He, in the autumn of 1937, he gave a speech in Chicago in which he likened the appropriate response to aggression in East Asia to what civilized advanced countries do when there's an outbreak of infectious disease. He used the word quarantine. We will quarantine the aggression. He didn't say we're going to send troops into China. He didn't say we're going to impose an embargo against Japan. He just uttered a, very, a pretty innocuous word. We're going to try to quarantine the aggression. But the backlash against even this among the isolationists was sufficient that Roosevelt backed off. Roosevelt later could be taken to task, was taken to task, for not taking a more forthright view and leading the United States, pushing the United States into war sooner. But he had his reasons, and I'm going to explain to you in a moment or two, why his reasons were wise and prudent in the outcome. Roosevelt watched, and Americans watched, as Europe descended toward another great war. There was a civil war that broke out in Spain. The fascists had already taken control in Italy. The Nazis took control in Germany. And Americans, well again, once a working majority of Americans said, that's not our problem and boy we're glad that we washed our hands of Europe. Those crazy Europeans, they're gonna do again what they did in the 1910s. Last time, we were stupid enough to think that we could resolve their problems. This time, we're going to be smart enough to steer clear. And Roosevelt, Roosevelt reckoned that the United States is not going to be able to steer clear. But he also understood that he had an unprecedented opportunity to do something that no American president had ever done. And that was get elected a third time. Now, it was going to violate the de facto George Washington limit of two terms, but there seemed to be extenuating circumstances. The world was going to war. And in fact, Germany made it explicit and formal in the autumn of 1939 by invading Poland. So now Europe really is at war. Japan and China are there at war. And it seems that the world is in flames. And Roosevelt begins to float the idea that, okay, maybe I should run for a third term. There was the expected criticism. You can't have a third term. George Washington didn't have a third term. You think you're better than George Washington? And Roosevelt didn't answer it explicitly in those terms, but the, the slogan that went out was, well, better a third term than a third raider as to who the opposition might be. And the Republicans had nobody of sort of compelling stature in international affairs, in part because the Republicans had been the party, well, actually, I shouldn't blame it entirely on their party, but the Republicans, nobody had any international stature in the United States because of the fact that the United States had been isolationist for two decades. So Roosevelt, as president of the United States, was the one who was most credible in dealing with this world crisis. And so he, uh, he ran for president a uh, third time, and he was elected. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Roosevelt sees this opportunity, not simply to become a third president, to become a great president, a president in the mold of Abraham Lincoln. Because Roosevelt, before almost anybody else in the United States in a position of responsibility or authority, understood that the United States was going to have to fight in this war. Roosevelt recognized something about Adolf Hitler that a lot of other people didn't or wouldn't acknowledge. 
And that was Hitler and Hitler's regime required war for its legitimacy. So if Hitler talked about, well, then by the time Roosevelt was elected, Hitler hadn't double-crossed Stalin yet, but he was going to. And Hitler had not, he had talked about, brooded the idea of some kind of negotiated peace with Britain, but by this time Winston Churchill is Prime Minister of Britain, and Churchill recognized the same thing in Hitler that Roosevelt saw, that this was someone with whom there is no long-term agreement. The nature of the Nazi regime was such that whoever is left standing, the Nazis are going to come after. Amer many Americans, led by now, now we have a group that's explicitly called the America Firsters, led by Charles Lindbergh and others, said, okay, what we need to do is to garrison the Western Hemisphere and we'll deal with you know, Hitler when the time comes. We'll fight Hitler on our terms and on our shores. And Roosevelt recognized that that's, that's not going to work. And far better to fight the war far away than on our home turf. So Roosevelt eventually leads the, well, no, no, he doesn't lead the United States into World War II. He lets the American people lead him into World War II. Roosevelt saw that the problem that Woodrow Wilson faced at the end of World War I was that Americans had not been convinced going into the war that the war was really necessary. Wilson took the lead in taking the United States to war. And so when things didn't turn out as Wilson had hoped and promised, Americans could turn against Wilson and say, in fact, they called it, this is Mr. Wilson's war. This isn't America's war. And so Franklin Roosevelt had been watching. He had been in the Wilson administration while this was going on, and he took metal notes. And Roosevelt, by this time, was thinking, I could be president one day. And this is how I'm going to do it if I'm president. I'm going to lag behind the American people. And I'm going to let the American people drag me into the war. Now, Roosevelt caused Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, from 1940, to agonize over whether the Americans were ever going to come to the rescue of democracy. And Churchill would let out ideas that maybe... Maybe if Britain is forced to surrender, then the, the royal fleet, it will be captured by the Nazis and the Americans will really be at risk. And you really better do something, Mr. President. And Roosevelt was able to do a few things to, get, to help Britain stay afloat. But he refused to act in a decisive way until the war came to America. And the war came to America in December 1941. And December 7th, 1941. And in the two hours it took the Japanese dive bombers to raid Pearl Harbor, the isolationist position in the United States was utterly discredited. And it was discredited for 70 years or more. World War II to Americans was known as the good war, because it was a war that, was, that had to be fought. It wasn't a discretionary war. It wasn't a war of choice. We had to fight because we were attacked. And furthermore, as the war developed, and as the nature of the Nazi regime became clear after the war, it was the clearest example in American history of a war of good against evil. Most wars, and I'm, I have to say, it was the clearest example. It wasn't a perfectly clear example because the United States fought against the Nazi regime and fought against the Japanese militarists. But who was America's principal ally? Well, the British. Okay, we'll put them on the side of good. But who was the ally that did the most fighting and dying? It's the Soviet Union. And you could get a, a spirited, rather ghoulish debate as to who was the greatest monster of the 20th century. Was it Hitler or Stalin? And in fact, if you want to throw into the mix Mao Zedong, who was America's other ally during World War II? China. And so the United States fought World War II not to make the world safe for democracy. Americans remembered that crusading spirit of World War I, and they weren't going to fall for that again. 
But ironically, rather than make, the, well, I would say rather than make the world safe for democracy, maybe while they made the world safe for democracy, they also made the world safe for communism. So democracy squared off against fascism in World War II. And democracy beat fascism, but on the side of democracy was communism. And communism got a new lease on life in World War II. And Americans discovered after the war that, okay, we beat the fascists, but now we have to deal with the communists. I said earlier that there was a, a phase that began on 1941, lasted until 2017. And it was a, a period of American history in which, to which first of all, uh, according to Brands' second law, sooner or later you get the foreign policy you can afford. By, 19, by the 1940s, Americans all understood we can afford to have the most ambitious foreign policy in the world, probably in world history. We can shape the world to our predilections. We can make the world the way we want it to be, and here's how we're going to do it. We are going to eliminate or definitely take on head on the problems that gave rise to World War II. The problems of countries being outlaws one to the other, and the problems that gave rise to the Great Depression. The period that starts in 1941 and that lasted until 2017 were based on the twin pillars of free trade, this addressed the trade wars of the 1930s, and collective security. This is the idea that the United States was isolationist, should remain isolationist. Every president of the United States, from Franklin Roosevelt through Barack Obama, agreed wholeheartedly with these two principles. Free trade. This makes countries of the world think of what they have in common, how they can do business, based on the principle that where goods cross borders, soldiers don't have to. And it has been, I'm going to say it has been, because we're still, it still is in effect. It has been enormously successful in keeping the world at peace. One of the questions I pose to my students is, there was World War I and there was World War II, why no World War III? And usually some bright students say, well, shouldn't you say, why no World War III yet? And the answer is, that's exactly right. So why no World War III yet? In part because of pillar one, which is free trade. Make each country, every other country's customers. And the second pillar is collective security. Make it clear to the world that if there's an aggressor out there, you're taking on not simply Poland, but you're taking on the rest of the world. And we will come after you. And the period that started in 1941, the period of World War II, it began with World War II, was the period that ushered in the most profound period of peace in modern history. One could almost say world history. And it's been characterized most importantly, by this striking absence of World War III, of another great war. And people have come up with various reasons why there has been no World War III, and some say it's because of the existence of nuclear weapons. Oh, I mean, that's certainly got something to do with it. But the fact is that the United States, the most powerful country, has taken this leadership position. The United States has been behind, free trade has been behind collective security. And Peace doesn't just happen. Peace isn't simply the absence of war. It has to be constructed. It has to be cultivated. And every American president from Franklin Roosevelt through Barack Obama did that. The reason I said, you figured it out, the reason I said January 20th, 2017, is that the current president has challenged both of those bases of this period of the long peace. Now, World War III is not broken out yet. And with President Trump, it's unclear how much of what he says is something that he actually intends to follow through on. So I can't say that this, the period of World War II, I'm going to call it the era of World War II, which lasts from 1941 until almost now. I'm not going to say it's over yet. I will say that is, it is under a threat, that it hasn't been under during that whole period. And I would say that this is something we all need to pay attention to. Once again, you know, it's not impossible that the world could revert to the way it looked in the 1920s and 1930s. We know how that period ended, and we need to hope and make sure that we don't come to a similar bad ending in our era. Thank you very much.